So at HANA, we leverage um, emergent technology or ordinary technology to uh, to experiment with architecture, uh, urbanism, material, tectonics. Um, and so today our lecture will go over a couple of projects that range from, um, from furniture to the building scale. Um, so should we start? Yes, so we'll, we'll start the, uh, the screen sharing. Let's see okay. how that goes. Yep. All right, so um, can, can you see our screen right now? Um, Yep. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. So we'll go back to to this. So so well. Thank you, uh, Raphael. Even if we can't hear you uh, right now for the uh, kind invitation to lecture here this morning. Uh, for us, it's in the evening, um, 8 p.m. Uh, on a Monday night. Uh, we are very thrilled to lecture here at Hanyang University from our living room. And we send our greetings to the Hanyang community uh, during those challenging times. Uh, we've actually visited the campus once, uh, I think, in, in 2017. Um, so we know the school a little bit. The title of our lecture is Forms of Making. And we think that making is fundamental to how we operate as HANA. So from the ground up, digital design fabrication technologies are intrinsic to the making of our work, facilitating fundamentally new material methods, tectonic articulations, environmental practices, technological affordances, and forms of construction. Um, as architectural designers, we consider ourselves to be biased generalist rather than specialist. And the various projects presented in this lecture combine a variety of methods of making, material applications, geometries, and social narratives. We build and embrace shared technology. We create open source construction machines, which we argue inevitably affect how we think and design through making. In our work, we aim to mine the tension between machine means and architectural ends across scales. We reclaim authorship over processes of construction that influence the way we can build or perhaps ought to build in the future. At various scales, our work's performance and architectural expression are inherently derived from materiality, digital construction protocols, robotic routines, bottom-up design logics. And at the same time, in the mix of means, our work is inspired by precedent, program, ecological considerations, collective labor, personal obsessions, and the misuse of technology. Based on the title of our lecture, we're also interested in the F word, and we do admit that openly, and when discussing the F word, Andrea Simich, our department chair at Cornell, talks about informed form, which is form augmented by information. By form becomes malleable as a concept and implies that architecture is an interplay between aesthetic values or design and broader types of information that can act upon form, that collaborate with form, or that produce synergies with form. How does making inform architecture? How does environment, technology, program, history, and our discipline itself inform the making of architecture? The following projects are work in progress and aim to give expression through design to some of these questions. We spent the last five years building an infrastructure and framework for architectural explorations across scales starting from the design of tools, moving to prototypes and installations, and then combining all research into the construction of small building. 
So about five years ago, we became interested in a new method of making, namely concrete 3D printing. And after starting a collaboration with building industry, we were disappointed by the limitations at that time. And so in order to conduct research in advanced manufacturing and engage new me methods of making, one needs the facilities and the means to do such work. And so on the left, you see a printer that Leslie and I built in 2011. And on the right, you see the printer that RCL developed at Cornell in 2016. And they're based on the same uh, framework, open source framework, more or less. So the printer is fully open source and runs off an Arduino board with slightly modified firmware. Um, a 3D model, parts list, and wiring diagram can be downloaded on our website, which is very important to us that this is an openly accessible technology. We think that fully unpacking the manufacturing tool or machine is an exciting opportunity for architects to reclaim authorship over processes of construction, which fundamentally influence the way we can build. So what you see here is a laid out uh, parts a photo of the printer itself with a couple steel welded parts and then precision pieces that we ordered off McMaster car. So this is the full kit that you need uh, to build such a printer. And while the machine is only a framework, our thesis is with new tools come new architectural opportunities. So this machine, as simple as it might be, affords new architectural opportunities. We also believe that new technology comes with a social responsibility to make these tools broadly available to all. And so the printer itself costs about $6,000 to make. And this is roughly uh, an overview of what you would need in terms of steel and hardware uh, to build such a machine. The printer itself was built over a three week period uh, in a collaborative option studio at Cornell in 2016. And this is the, the photo shoot, the final photo shoot of the printer. And so after a period of material development and machine modification, Daedalus is now able to print full-scale building components in foam, recycled plastic, and uh, concrete. And for us, this new tool opens the door to novel architectural speculation. And our interest was in the following process. So like a three-dimensional drawing, the machine horizontally deposits one line after another. And if lines are shifted through corbeling, the, the printer creates spatial form. This is what you see here. So one line after another with a slight offset, it produces spatial form. And so for us inherent in this rather simple process, is the complex architectural language of uh, concrete 3D printing. The 3D printer, a machine which has long been characterized as characterless due to having little to no constraint, is in fact exactly the opposite. It has plenty of character and maybe a little bit too much even. In the project Additive Architectural Elements, our research question is, what is the architecture of 3D printed concrete? How can materiality and the unique fabrication opportunities and constraints of the tool inform the design? And before we ask the questions of what is the architecture of 3D printed concrete, let's look at a prominent chapter of concrete architecture which inspires us. The development of reinforced concrete around 1850 has enabled unprecedented architectural expression. Throughout the past 150 plus years, there have been various interpretations of what constitutes an architecture of concrete. We might think of heroic cantilevers, fluidity, or a distinct articulation of board form construction processes and exposed concrete structures. Admittedly, our work, our concrete element here from previous slide produces a certain visual linkage. Paul Rudolph, rough, striated, brutal. By association, we asked ourselves, what, if anything, do we have in common with such works of architecture? For us, concrete architecture is most intriguing when there is a symbiosis between what the material or method of construction demands, as well as the idiosyncratic 
willful and biased expressive intention of the architect. The merging of the two worlds of technical reason with expressive intuition at times produce moments of stunning architectural brilliance, beauty, and intellectual satisfaction. In both our research and practice, we aim to bring about and introduce such balance to new processes of making, and it's admittedly a work in progress. Building the machine was perhaps the easy part, um, with the aim of derive, to derive an architecture that is intrinsic to additive manufacturing process, we experimented with dozens of initial concrete mixture and printing failures to understand the material's tolerance and its inherent urge for imprecision. When printing in concrete, the same rules apply as in a small desktop 3D printer. But gravity here takes on an altogether different role in the process. Now cantilevers will have to be carefully constructed. New support material strategies have to be developed. And tool paths have to be carefully manipulated. And we see this manipulation of 3D printing rule sets as a tremendous opportunity. Architecture printing, concrete printing, requires the development of an entirely new architectural language, which takes into account the limitations of the process as well as its performative advantage. In this project, we aim to reveal the 3D printer's own and highly idiosyncratic architectural tectonics and narratives. We chose prototypical motifs, floor, column, door, wall, ceiling, and began to develop strategies as to how the layering of the concrete, this relentless three-dimensional drawing of extruded lines and material, and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. So working with the constraint of gravity, this element here, the mushroom column, plays with the cantilever over support material by printing upside down. With horizontal striation resulting in structural assemblies that seamlessly transition between the vertical and the horizontal. As you can see, each element, we have developed seven iterations, seven different possibilities, and the proto architecture that, um, in a way, play with uh, the elements spatially. In the second prototype, which is the window, the core window, um, all common architectural motifs and building components must be rethought to fit the logic of layered construction. For example, a concrete printer cannot print in midair. Therefore, the otherwise rather simple task of creating a rectilinear window um, is become kind of impossible. So rather than drastically altering the process, meaning stopping the machine to insert a beam, shortcoming can become opportunity for design. One logical consequence for the window is to cantilever incrementally and become a triangular corbelled arc. Suddenly, seemingly advanced technology relies on obsolete or archaic strategies such as corbelling here. In the case of the element force column, the modification of printing direction, um, whether it is printing upside down or printing in section, is deployed to overcome printer deficiencies. Printed in section, this force column hints at the potential to deposit material where structurally necessary. And here in this element, which is called the smart pochet wall, Similar to the force column, it explores the manipulation of concrete density to optimize for structural performance. And how it might begin to be architecturally expressed in the wall assembly. The potential for excessive ornamentation is brought up here in this ornament. And the full scale prototype we play with the delamination of layers to create screen-like moments of transparency. Ornamentation can also occur horizontally in the floor ornament, 
Besides patterning, the florimand can be structurally and algorithmically optimized. And 3D printing also opens the possibility for an integration of building systems and furniture. The ceiling element is an expressive play on ducts for ventilation, reflectors for lighting, becoming a performative poche. There are multiple narratives at play in this project, and we chose to present the work with a particular speculative focus. We can also discuss the work in various other terms as well, from a technical point of view. There are multiple advantages to 3D printing. All of the elements, geometries are constructed without the use of formwork. That constitutes a paradigm shift for concrete construction and allows for a radical mass customization of buildings and building components. There is also great potential for material savings because the 3D printer can deposit material where structurally necessary, an enormous advantage and path towards smarter construction. Undeniably, there is a certain formal agenda at play in this project. Bottom-up processes are highly deterministic when it comes to form making, informed by the digital process. Yet there are important top-down decisions to be made which are harder to quantify than necessary when determining the architecture of 3D printed concrete. And then from the element project, we explore how we can deploy the architecture additive elements in the building context. The Fabricate Lelong project explores the potential of computational protocols, such as additive manufacturing at the architectural scale, a speculative housing design at the urban scale. The smart crochet wall is expanded in the context of multi-unit housing. It can be densified for structural load, thickened for a party wall, and attenuated to meet the thinness of glazing transition. The corp window element is explored here as both window and entrance openings at the housing scale. And the ceiling element can form individual modules or organize into a cross modular system with mechanical con construction across multiple units. Here, the force column is transformed into an integrated wall and beam system, where the patterning of the wall is extruded in section to produce floors and integrated beam. At the cluster scale, smart pochet walls are mass customized to address different domestic functions and expanded as pochet cores for the utilities and circulation. They can be organized into continuous row houses. And apart from the typological transformation, the original spine organization of linear semi-public space is transformed into a weaving network of semi-public alleys and courtyard spaces. Therefore, designing with the uh, additive architecture elements at the housing scale can offer alternate inspirations to build our city fabric. Uh, the next project uh, that we want to talk about is at the furniture scale, uh, informed by new processes of making, materiality, and program. Rolling Stones is the winning design for the Folly Function 2018 competition sponsored by the Architectural League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park. The seeds can be rolled and are constructed using a large scale 3D printer at the Cornell Robotic Construction Laboratory. And 3D printing with concrete enables the creation of 25 affordable and self similar, but ultimately entirely individual seeds. So what you see here is Leslie rolling an initial prototype. And so this is the same seed, but whenever it's rotated, it produces a different seating configuration. Leveraging movement architecturally and as folly itself, park visitors discover new seating configurations with each turn. Responding to scales within the public park landscape, the rolling stones form a long continuous bench object, aggregate into smaller benches, 
or disperse entirely to form different size seeding groups or solitary compositions. And this is the final project um, as it was deployed in the uh, park in New York. Each seat is different. Some concrete chair configurations encourage a more upright seating position, while others animate lounging and relaxation. Some of the configurations are designed for single users, while others enable a back-to-back -back double occupancy. And if aggregated, the seats allow for side-by-side -side double occupancy. So you see that um, depending on how you roll the chairs, sometimes your feet are dangling in the air, sometimes they touch the ground. Each time the rolling stones are flipped, they reveal new seating profiles and curvatures. This encourages a playful interaction with the furniture and means that users have the freedom to configure seating arrangements based on their individual preferences. And here you see the rolling process. Um, the stones are heavy, they are concrete after all, but no longer bound to the relentless paradigm of standardization, 3D printing opens the possibility for design freedom, customization, and individuality. So whether small or large, tall or big, each body type is represented in the concrete profiles. And this is an image of the seats as a continuous bench object. But as we mentioned, they can also aggregate into smaller benches or disperse entirely to form different size groups or solitary compositions. And they provide a range of scale and seating configurations from stool to small chairs for the public. So while the sectional profiles reference archetypes of chairs, seats, and lounge chairs, the layered fabrication process creates a comfortable textured seating surface. So we have been asked many times, you know, whether or not these things are actually comfortable. And we have to say that they are quite comfortable as, as chairs. Um, Every time when someone's on their chair, they're like, wow, I'm surprised <laughs> how comfortable it is. That's the comment. <laughs> but Leslie dialed in all the curvatures uh, as to make them comfortable as seats. And as we mentioned before, 3D printing allows for the mass customization of the seating furniture. Uh, at no additional fabrication cost. It also increases material efficiency, reduces waste material, and eliminates the need for costly and wasteful formwork. So we can print 25 separate chairs because we're using the 3D printer and we don't need to make the formwork. The material used in the 3D printing process is a Portland cement, uh, which is reinforced with nylon fibers. So we make a mortar with uh, Portland cement and sand. And that results in a fairly strong concrete assembly. And in addition, each seat is supported by three steel rebar profiles embedded within a double concrete layer. So you see that in the, in the little exploded axon diagram there. Um, and also in the image on the right, um, every couple li uh, lines, uh, we 3D print a double layer and embed the formwork in there. To enable the creation of their cantilevered forms, the seat's interior is supported with a bed of gravel during printing. A layer of gravel remains imprinted on each chair's interior surface, giving it a geologic character, also an honest reading of the fabrication process. And this video shows the making of the Rolling Stones. So those are some of the early prototypes. Um, and some of the conceptual drawings that show the different uh, types of aggregations and how the stones will be used in the park. And those are some of the initial printing um, studies. So this is the first layer going down onto a sheet of plastic. And you see that the setup and uh, printing process is actually quite simple. This is not a highly automated machine. So this requires a lot of people to keep running and uh, the gravel needs to be filled in manually. So in the beginning, we did a few reinforcement tests, looking at single layer reinforcement, looking at sort of fiber reinforcement um, in critical layers, um, looking at the, a more sort of embedded steel reinforcement and in the end settled for uh, a rebar reinforcement, like uh, what we just talked about in the diagram. So you see how the rebar is embedded. 
and print it into the chair, which means that we had to fabricate uh, 75 different rebar profiles. And the printing takes about um, a full day for these six pieces. And this is the excavation process. And then in terms of load capacity, they're quite happy with compression forces and maybe less happy with um, tensile forces. And this project was installed in 2018 in the Sculpture Park. And um, we also want to thank our team as a part of this, our sponsors. Um, now, uh, sort of shifting gears a little bit, besides exploring the architectural potential, <coughs> excuse me, of horizontal layer printing, we're also interested in developing new processes of manufacturing. And this project here, sub-additive 3D printing, was done at RCL with Christopher Battaglia and, and Martin Miller. Martin Miller is a colleague of mine here at Cornell, and Christopher Battaglia is a teaching fellow at Ball State. And at RCL, based on um, Chris Battaglia's MARC thesis, we developed a, a special method of concrete 3D printing <clears throat> where the concrete gets deposited on a support material, in this case, gravel. So you see that on the left. And um, so sub-additive printing is a fundamental deviation from the um, standard process of 3D printing, which is a horizontal deposition of tool paths layer upon layer. This is what we were talking about in the previous project. But so for certain complex geometries like shells, this method has severe disadvantages. And dep depositing cementers material on a supportive aggregate is not a new thing. The Philips Pavilion, for example, at the Brussels Expo 58 was one of the first modern examples to panelize a large complex surface through landforming. And so casting on a shaped hyperbolic sand form, multiple panels were produced as sections of the surface then transferred to the site and post-tensioned to create the structure. And so here's what's smart about this technique. The same machine that prints the concrete is used to create the flexible gravel formwork. So here in the first step, you see how the 3D printer creates a surface that matches the curvature of the thin shell geometry, so making its own formwork. And so you see the 3D printer um, carving into the surface where the tool paths would go. And then later in a second step, the concrete material is deposited uh, using the reu uh, onto the reusable gravel formwork. This is what happens here. And so you see Chris printing the very first um, example of a surface. And with this method, one can rapidly print highly mass customized and optimized gridded thin shell structures, which is what uh, is very exciting uh, for us. So it's, a, it's an entirely new method of, uh, of 3D printing. And here you see how the excavation goes. So this is really thin print uh, with just two layers and um, the kind of curvatures that you can get here in some other photos. Um, and here you see the same printing process using a robot. Um, it's a bit messier than we would like, uh, but this is something that we're currently working on. So with the robot, obviously, there's the advantage that you're 3D printing normal to the surface. Um, and so the print itself can become um, cleaner that way and more organized. And so this is now speeding up the process a little bit in the video. Um, and so using the 3D printers or the robot's flexibility, we can use form finding methods and structural optimization to, to determine the lattice density required at each point within the surface. And so depending on the shape of the structure, we get different lattice patterns, uh, which also is a method to reduce uh, waste material or general material use in the printing process. And so in our research in the lab and in the practice, we think it's paramount to uh, test full-scale prototypes. So this is a mock-up of, uh, of sub-additive sub printed arches. Each component weighs roughly 150 kilograms and was printed in the span of one hour 
and can be rolled up for easy assembly. As a new method, subadditive printing leverages digital workflows to produce structurally, materially, and spatially optimized building components while dramatically reducing waste material. Contextually, sub uh, the subadditive project expands on a lineage of thin shell structures by the likes of Nervi, Candela, Isler, or Dieste, but also other kinds of um, precedents. And we are currently working on improved printing accuracy, the integration of fiber reinforcement, and novel cement mixtures that don't have a massive environmental impact. And the latter point is very important to us because we cannot sustain concrete as a building material by saving material alone. So concrete has to be fundamentally rethought in the context of 3D printing to become a viable future building material in either of the processes that we're showing. So back to the tools here, because a concrete 3D printer can really only get you that far. Compared to other institutions, RCL has limited resources. So uh, what we had to do is have to be inventive when it comes to equipment. And as it turns out, that one can go to eBay and purchase a used KUKA KR200 robot, robotic arm for $8,000. And this is how it arrived in Ithaca in a winter one year. The robot was formerly a welding robot for GM, producing cars in the plant in Louisiana. While the machine is proprietary, it was important for us to keep the rest of the project open source. In terms of cost, it is hard to find a cheaper robot. This is the cost breakdown of the robot and the self-developed foundation system that we use. A certain amount of hacking is required to make this robot work for an architectural production. All information on how to set this up is available on the RCL website. And also an Acadia paper written by um, Sasha and Chris Battaglia called the Open Source Factory. For us, this robot enabled research beyond the three axis constraints of the 3D printer. And it is a new technological means for us to inform form and new material exploration. So changing material now from concrete into wood. Um, Lognot is a project that emerged from our first initial exploration with custom wood-based tools for the robot. As a building material, we encounter wood in the shape of two by fours or plywood or other standardized dimensions. But as the diagram on the upper left shows, wood comes from trees that are usually non-standard. And so log knot is one possible method for creating complex curvature in timber by cutting and reassembling tree trunks. And you see some of the early diagrams here and, uh, and the precedents uh, where some of these ideas also come from. And so, um, in, in this project, we will outline the, the processes and methodologies for robotic fabrication, variable complex curvature creation, joinery detailing, geometric and structural optimization, the reduction of moisture-related material failures, and on-site assembly for the log knot project. And what you see here is an early uh, full-scale prototype. So these early studies show how log knot creates an infinite loop of round wood curving three-dimensionally along its length. Once assembled, the components form a spatially complex figure eight knot. And what you see here is an early uh, model photo and a rendering of the project and some initial studies of how the knots could uh, be assembled or reassembled or constitute themselves on the site. And so in a reciprocal design process, the project fosters synergies and feedback between material, fabrication, digital form, and full-scale construction. Small round wood members or tree forks are usually not utilized for construction purposes because today's sawmills are not equipped to process irregular tree geometries. And so the project uses computation to optimize each joint for more moment forces. Additionally, each of these joints is precisely rotated to resist local torsion, which is what you see in this diagram. Structural, 
Structural optimization solvers were deployed to analyze forces in each segment. And this information was then fed into the design of a series of physical prototypes. So the research team tested conventional finger joints, mortise and tenon joints, dovetail joints, as well as custom steel dowel joints. And each of these methods exhibited severe shortcomings in either structural capacity, ease of assembly, or ease of robotic fabrication. And so based on knowledge gained from the initial joinery tests, the research team developed a custom trifold mortise and tenon joint, which is self-supportive during assembly and able to resist bending in multiple directions. And this is the joint that you see here. So the project was designed for this assembly, which is why we used lag bolts for connections. Um, it was also fully permitted, which is another reason uh, we had to use the lag bolts. And here in this diagram, you see the two standard details that we have for this project. So there's one connection uh, of log to log, and then there is another uh, of log to ground. And this is basically the, the detail that you have. To optimize load behavior, the radius of the round wood reduces towards the apexes of the knot and thickens at ground level, where moment forces and loads are the highest. And so you see that here in the fly through, it gets thinner towards the top. A custom robotic platform with a 4.5 kilowatt air-cooled spindle was used for fabrication. And the open source robotic uh, platform used for this project um, is uh, the one that Leslie talked about uh, based on a repurposed KUKA KR200 uh, with a KRC2 control unit. Um, so first, using the three quarter inch square end mill bit, the rough pass protocol creates an even surface angled at 15 degrees from the face as normal. And then second, the angled surface is created the mortise and tenon rough pass is cut at four inches deep, which is what you see here, the rough pass. Third, the finishing cut is executed using the side of the bit instead of its tip, thus further taking advantage of the robot six axis flexibility. And this is a fabrication move that saves a lot of time um, because there's no uh, sort of finish milling required. And so this is an overview of the fabrication process. The fourth and final tool path, visible on the right, finishes the undercut detail. So each of these joints has one location with a slight undercut, which means that the mortise and tenon is secured in place, and the wood geometry prevents it from slipping out or disconnecting. So there's a slight uh, rotation that occurs when these two pieces meet, and the undercut helps it once it's secured from disconnecting and slipping back out. To prevent checking and shaking, the milled end grains were covered in pentacryl, a fast-acting, non-toxic, non-hygroscopic, and non-oxidizing wood stabilizer. So this is something that we had to do um, after the, each piece was cut um, twice a day. It was coated to prevent any sort of splitting or checking. And as we work with small budgets, we did not have access to heavy machinery and therefore developed a self-sufficient construction method that requires only minimal formwork or support. So Lognot was assembled by a dedicated team over the course of about three days, and each component of the knot was lifted in place by hand, which is what you see here, and then fastened in place using the geometry of the joint to guide the form of the arch. So after each completed knot arch segment, the structure was attached to the ground using earth anchors. So you see uh, the initial process of attaching one piece here. And to hold up the structure during construction, all that's required is a minimal support of attached two by fours. And you see them coming uh, into view at the top. So every once in a while, we had to attach two by fours to hold the structure up, but otherwise it's self-sufficient. So to conclude, unfamiliar notions of craftsmanship and precision, both digital and analog, emerge from Lognot's conceptual design practice and characteristic construction technique. Lognot was exhibited as part of Cornell's 2018 biannual called Duration, Passage, Persistence, Survival, and addresses this theme on multiple levels. Environmental cycles, birth, growth, and decay are intrinsic to complex forest ecosystems and processes. 
Conceptually and spatially, the log log project references these eternal cycles and reciprocal relationships between systems, both natural and technical. The infinitely looping structure is an interplay between archaic natural geometry, advanced computation, and state-of-the-art digital fabrication. By questioning how forests are used as a resource, Lognod provides a critical commentary on various perpetual wood cycles, economic, environmental, and cultural in nature. In the last project, we will look at how from the ground up, new material means and construction methods can be intrinsic to the making of the building. Um, we will talk about the Ashen Cabin, which is a project that started in the summer of 2007 and was finished in the summer of 2019. 17. Sorry, 2017 and then finished in 2019. Um, from the ground up, digital design and fabrication technologies are intrinsic to the making of this architectural prototype, facilitating fundamentally new material methods, tectonic articulations, and forms of construction. It is informed by multiple forces. The building follows two strands of material narratives here. First, it is 3D printed from concrete, and then it's clothed in a robotically fabricated envelope constructed from irregular wood logs. The first material narrative is about 3D printed concrete. Um, the cabin has a footprint of three meters by three meters and lifts off the ground on 3D printed legs which adjusts to the slope terrain. All concrete components for this project were fabricated on the self-built large-scale 3D printer shown earlier by Sasha. The concrete structure is characterized by three programmatic areas. As you see in this photo, there's a table that kind of looks like a bidet in the beginning, and then a storage seat element, and a 6.5 meter tall working fireplace. This project as similarly pursued in the additive architecture element project was to reveal the 3D printer's idiosyncratic tectonic language, again by exploring how the layer in concrete, this relentless de deposition of extruded lines, and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. The cabin is printed in components that function as sacrificial zero-waste formwork for the main structure system to eliminate substantial construction waste. And this photo shows the printing process on the printer um, at the RCL. For the project, we develop a new building process relying upon a cast-in-place concrete structure with custom rebar. This slide shows the interior of the printed concrete leg with inserted rebar cage. To enable steep cantilever of 60 degree for printed geometries, a reusable gravel support material method was developed to provide necessary structural support during the concrete printing process. And the printed formwork was designed in small sectional modules to be transported and assembled manually without the use of heavy machinery at the remote construction site. And here you can see how they're transported as well because um, they, they essentially each leg is subdivided into separate modules. We can, they can be nested when we transport them. Here's a top view of the cast in place structure with the rebar cage in place. As you can see here, each leg is then filled with foam in the void of the legs and the concrete are poured in between to form the structure. And this photo show how the cabin is going up. Here is the assembly of the chimney. And corbeling here again becomes an expressive and also functional motif to highlight moments of programmatic significance throughout the concrete structure. And horizontal layer concrete 3D printing, geometric surface complexity and sectional transformation are achieved through corbeling and incremental offset of two path trajectories. And here is the underside. 
And throughout the cabin, the tectonic expression is generated by the fabrication method and materiality. In deliberately designing a cabin and not a pavilion or installation, we had to address broader architectural considerations such as how, do we, how does the building touch the ground as suggested in the previous slide, and also how do we 3D print a fireplace. So here is the image of the fireplace opening. And similarly, it uses corbeling, similar to the corb window and the additive architectural element project. And also, it was interesting to think about how do we create the transition between the legs and the horizontal slab and the chimney? Or how is the floor made? Here we use the G-code and the print path as a, as a way to um, produce ornamental pattern, uh, while at the same time, it is the print path of the machine of the floor slab. The slab is also organized in a nine square grid, reflecting the interlocking pattern of the legs beneath. The concrete portion of the cabin was completed in August, 2017. For the second material narrative, we would like to start with some research context. The ashen cabin is also informed by a key environmental crisis of the ash trees in North America. Here is an image of the Cornell Arnott Teaching and Research Forest, where the ash borer arrived in 2018. The emerald ash borer is a small beetle whose larvae latch underneath, hatch underneath the tree's bark and cut off vital layers that transport nutrients throughout its trunk. The invasive EAB threatens to eradicate most of the 8.7 billion ash trees in North America. And since its discovery in the United States in 2002, the ash borer killed tens of millions of ash trees and has drastically transformed entire forest ecosystems in the process. As of October 2018, it is found in 35 states and several Canadian provinces. And as a reference, about 10% of all trees in New York state are ash trees. This is a huge environmental problem and climate risk but also opportunities to mediate um, for mediation um, for mediating the crisis, where we believe that invest, infested and dying ash trees form an enormous and untapped material resource for sustainable wood construction. The ashen cabin challenges preconceived notions about material standards and wood. The cabin utilizes wood infested by the emerald ash borer for its envelope, which unfortunately is widely considered as waste. Due to their challenging geometries, most infested ash trees cannot be processed by regular sawmills and are therefore regarded as unsuitable for construction. And in this process, as you can see in this diagram, we have developed um, uh, a process to how to translate some of these irregular tree logs um, into building envelopes. So first, by implementing high precision 3D scanning and robotic-based fabrication technology. As you can see here, this is a tree fork that is mounted um, and scanned. Irregularly shaped waste wood transforms into an abundantly available, affordable, a morbidly sustainable building material for the Anthropocene. And so after the 3D scan, then we, they are processed in, uh, um, uh, in rhino and grasshopper. And uh, here's a simulation of the slicing of the wood and the actual slicing of the wood with the bent saw. So utilizing a KUKA KR200 with a custom five horsepower bent saw and defector, we can robotically slide irregular tree logs into naturally curved boards and strategically assemble the boards to form a variety of surface conditions. The boards follow the geometry of the naturally bent logs and can be sliced into various and varying thicknesses up to two millimeter thin. Also by adjusting the thickness of the cut, 
The robotically carved timber boards can be assembled as single curvature surfaces or complex double curvature surfaces, as you can see here. For the cabin, we used a log harvested from 10 trees from the forest. And what's amazing is that the robotic equipment enables us to design and work with natural tree geometries. In order to process and design with the logs, geometric form finding and assembly protocols from form to log and log to form were developed for this project. This diagram here shows one of the facade um, and it is made up of a series of logs here and the different slicing angle and thicknesses that were used to accentuate uh, and produce some of the uh, envelope curvature. And once cut, the boards are arrayed into interlocking SIP facade panels and solid offcuts can be structurally integrated in the assembly, which results in the minimal waste fabrication method. The SIPs, uh, structurally insulated panels, are insulated using a two component closed cell foam for which a fully biodegradable option is also available. So on the left here, you see the exon detail um, of the, 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 the SIP um, insection. And on the right is uh, an interior shot of the window opening. The facade is fully ventilated, detailed to manage shrinkage and transformation of wood boards to offset the air drying process, and therefore it does not require an additional ring screen. And this, um, this is the east facade, the east elevation, and the actual built cabin. Architecturally, the Ashen cabin walks the line between familiar and unfamiliar, between technologically advanced and formally elemental. The undulated wooden surfaces accentuate the building's program, yet remain reminiscent of the natural log geometry which they are derived from. The curvature of the wood is strategically deployed to highlight moments of architectural importance, such as windows, entrances, roofs, canopies, or provide additional programmatic opportunities, such as integrated shelving, desk space, or storage. And no longer bound to the paradigm of industrial standardization, a wooden two by four, this project revisits bygone woodcraft and design based on organic, found, and living materials. While well transformed, the natural tree remains legible in the design. We were, interested in we were interested in seeing how irregular timber geometries can be used to create fully functioning, ventilated, waterproof, and insulated, high-performance building envelope. So some of the questions are, you know, how does the envelope turn corners? What are the detailed connections between wood and concrete? How are windows integrated into the wall system? How can the natural curvature of the log inform an awning, an entrance, or a door handle? Or highlight a corner opening for an articulated drain scupper? or frame views from the interior. The cabin combines a variety of fabrication methods, material applications, geometries, and types of construction. Here is interior view um, with, as you can see, there is the 3D printed concrete chimney anchoring the entrance and and then um, the, the concrete table, which is uh, now equipped with a camping sink and with a view to the landscape on the left. At various scales, the cabin's performance, structure, and architectural expression are inherently derived from its digital construction protocols, robotic routines, materiality, and design logics. At the same time, in a mix of means, the project is inspired by precedent, history, program, ecological considerations, personal obsessions, 
and the creative misuse of technology. Together, the various and sometimes conflicting means, robotic or otherwise, inherently inform the form and the architectural expression of this project. It is important to emphasize that dialogue occurs at the scale of a building from the ground up using newly invented forms of making. To conclude, we would like to show a little video of the project. Um, we would also like to emphasize that all our projects are team efforts. And we'd like to thank our amazing and dedicated team. And we would also like to thank and acknowledge our uh, project sponsors for the extraordinary support. So in the video here, you can see the sourcing um, of the initial log, the 3D scanning, and some of the computational process, and the slicing of the envelope boards. Here it's um, so this is as you can see, this is the slicing of one of the tree forts. And you can see that it can be cut quite thin as well. And then you see the, the bandsaw, which is about five feet tall. So it's a pretty big bandsaw, it can cut up to 30 inch diameter logs. You see some of the tectonic articulations of the board and the kind of assembly versus reassembly of a natural log geometry that occurs in this process. And then how that translates into architectural moments within the project itself, both on the inside and the exterior. The inside, we decided to use or cut the logs in a much more um, straight uh, and flatter instead of the curved uh, articulation of the exterior envelope. And here is the corner of the cabin within its context. The site has beautiful um, light from the west during sunset. So, and yes, as, as Leslie has said, this is uh, we're presenting this work on behalf of a very big team. And we would like to thank uh, all our project sponsors and everyone who um, supported us. So, uh, thank you. Okay, so that was the lecture. So let's see if, if Raphael is uh, is back. Raphael, are you there? Okay, he's here, but it seems like he's still having difficulty with the sound. Oh. Hello. Okay, I'll put you on speaker. <laughs> All right. So, Sorry, uh, so much. Uh, it's probably going to be feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening. But um, yeah, first of all, thank you. It's like, extremely exciting what you guys are doing. And it must be mentioned that you guys are. Uh, the architectural winners of the uh, 2020 competition. Rafael, do you maybe want to turn off your sound um, on your computer? Then there won't be any feedback and we can make you really loud. Is that any better? Uh, no. Yeah, we still hear it. If you turn off your mic, or sorry, your speaker. Yeah, I've turned off. 
not sure why that uh, microphone is not working. Can everyone else hear Rafael? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, yes, I, I think oh, I yeah. can hear you, so we can we can try it this way. Okay. So I'll, I'll make a brief because this uh, audio is not working perfectly, and I'll open up the floor for uh, general questions. Okay. All right, we can also, uh, whatever you say, Rafael, we can sort of, you can type it and we can say it. <laughs> So yeah, and we we'd be we'd be happy to take any any questions. As questions, you can uh, type the questions and and start the whole rolling. I think there's too much feedback. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah, that seems to be. Oh yeah. Um, no. I don't think we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's uh, type. Okay, so you can type, and then we can um, basically be your voice here. Okay. Yeah. Let's. All right, so we're, uh, I guess, waiting for questions. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, good evening and here, good morning. <laughs> I'm Songtek Nam. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, without noise, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm I'm teaching architectural theory and history in Hanyang University, and I enjoy very much your lecture and your work. I'm very waiting your next work now. Uh, the rest work, the the rest uh, small architecture you showed us. Uh, that was for me like a primitive hut, oh. but uh, offered by 3D technology. Uh, it reminds me of Khan's Fisher House, uh, consisted of bottom part and upper part, bottom platform in low stone and up envelope in wood. Oh. So it seems uh, for me that uh, the architecture of a ruin, permanent ruin, but with high tech technology. So I think this is very archaic and uh, also technologic architecture. So it's, I'm very fascinated with it. Oh. Uh, my question is the following, and 3D printing technology and also robot technology are in the future of architectural constructions. It seems very clear. Uh, so in this case, uh, this constructive uh, technique and uh, constructive uh, system may introduce some uh, new form, new original form as a uh, uh, result. Oh. For you, uh, how will be the, the character of this architecture? How will be the former character introduced by this technology? Uh, my question is following the point of view August Shuaji the historian French in 19th century uh, who taken uh, the point of view, the relationship between uh, form and construction. So 
that is to say, in each period, we have a new technology related to new form. Mm -hmm. So for you, what can be the formal result uh, introduced by this technology? This is my question. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think this, this is a really, um, first of all, a great, great summary uh, of, of some of the work uh, that, that we've shown, but also uh, a really, really relevant uh, question. I think form is, it was, is always a, it's kind of a tricky, tricky topic to talk about. So for, for a certain period, like in the last maybe uh, 20 plus years, it was almost frowned upon to, to talk about form for certain reasons, uh, through a kind of uh, excessive, uh, perhaps, uh, nature of, of uh, sort of digital investigations and, and so on. I think what, what distinguishes this, uh, or what's, what's, what sort of tunes it in a slightly different way, is its, is its deep relationship to materiality. And this is where, this is one of the things that's really informing the form here. So it's both it's both the tool, and it's the it's the construction process, but it's really the material also that we're using that dictates to a certain extent what can and what can't be done, and it's teasing out these differences and sort of playing with them and exploiting them playfully. That I think um, is sort of what, what we're trying to do um, in in this work. And yes, it it does reference a, a whole range of other. Uh, discourses around form. I mean, at the same time, while we do think that form as a sort of question of design is an important parameter, there are other issues uh, related to environmental performance and and so on that 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 also play an important role. So there's a kind of social responsibility of architecture that goes beyond the discipline itself that one has to acknowledge and that maybe some of these tools allow us to address uh, moving into the future. And um, it, it is, uh, as you said, I think, um, you know, it's somewhat inevitable that uh, architecture um, will become more and more automated uh, in, in, the, in the near future um, because we are, we're moving, um, we are one of the last, so the building industry is one of the last disciplines um, that's, um, that's still not automated. And so uh, this is certainly something that, that will come. What's important for us is that we have agency in this process. So that's why uh, we think this is sort of uh, important uh, work that, that has to be done, that we have to develop agency in these processes early on before someone else says, this is how it's done. Yeah, and to add to that, um, I think apart from the agency, um, it's developing, you know, having agency in how the tools inform the design. It's also, as a designer, how do we also reclaim um, some of the, let's say, design decision in the process um, where the form or the, the, the expression is not determined fully by optimizations. Um, you know, one knows that, you know, we all know, we, we all currently have the capability to uh, fully optimize, um, let's say, structure forms and so on and so forth. And as you can see in um, a lot of our work, um, it's, it, it hints and plays with the logic of, you know, structural efficiency. Um, but a lot of it, you know, we sometimes are intentionally not to optimize, fully optimize structural efficiency in that sense. So allowing, let's say, the property of the material um, the quality of the wood or the bar or the geometry of the wood or in the case of the concrete, right, it's, it's, um, it's tendency to be inaccurate. Uh, you know, it works a very like big tolerance to actually inform the design um, or, you know, how we come up with details and, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. It says, uh, I'm just going to read it. Thanks for the lecture in terms of how you investigate and recontextualize the materiality by robotic constructions. Considering that the work you've introduced are architectural experimentations, what kind of criticism have you received and what was your reflection upon that? Um, I think one of the things that was 
oftentimes brought up is that um, you know we are exploring and playing with the opportunities of mass customization in um, you know with the tools and our work. And so um, one of the most common question is how do we scale this up? You know, like how do you translate from these experimental methods uh, at the smaller scale to really, you know, larger application, um, larger scale application? Um, so that's one of the things that we often mm -hmm. encounter a point as a first reaction. Um, not sure if it's a criticism, <laughs> maybe it is. Um, so I, you know, I think to maybe to start with that is um, that's why we intentionally had designed a, a cabin and not an installation so that we are the first step is to confront with how do you create a watertight um, ventilated and also uh, insulated envelope um, so in in this process you know despite using a very idiosyncratic and customized process the customized material, um, in this case, the irregular tree logs are actually turned into uh, what we call, you know, the, the SIP, a structural insulated panel, which is in a way a standardized, um, uh, standardized construction products uh, in our industry. And so finding ways to utilize these idiosyncratic pieces and also translating them into some form of conventional application was one way for us to deal with um, the first step of scaling up um, because uh, you cannot apply, you know, extremely idiosyncratic projects and, you know, in every project if, if, if it does need to be scaled up. I mean, yeah, one, one, one interesting thing about this is, is the question of bottom-up processes versus top-down processes. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to do a cabin and not uh, a pavilion or, or something like this. Um, so the cabin is something that we've been working on for, for quite some time. Um, and with the two material systems, it, it took that amount of planning. But there are certain decisions that are bottom-up. Um, and so uh, those are derived from materiality and, and certain construction logics. And then there are other uh, decisions that we had to make that are top down that, that uh, uh, relates to how this building sits on the site and how we want you to perceive it when you visit it and, and, and certain other, uh, the spatial sequence of the entry and, uh, and how, how corners are articulated, how details are articulated. Those are top-down decisions, and so this is something that uh, we, we found interesting in exploring in this project, kind of difference between uh, bottom-up and top-down. So there, there seem to be more questions uh, Yeah, but, but just to wrap that up, mm -hmm. but to also fully scale up one, one or I think we think that architects cannot do it alone, and one needs to engage with the building industry, and it's very important to engage with building industry to be able to scale up. Mm -hmm. And so that's also something that we're working on as a next step, engaging um, building industry here. Um, so yeah, the, there is the uh, Raf a comment by Raphael. Um, Getting back to Professor Nam's comment of the primitive hut, a lot of the methodology and work presented starts from the architectural element to produce a full system. Is there still a need to formalize a project through these elements? Do you start your projects from the elements? So that goes back to the question of bottom up versus top down. I think, yes, the, the projects are informed by some of these earlier studies, but they're, they're not sort of held to them exclusively. And so when we transitioned into the design of the building, other factors started playing a role, questions of program, questions of entry, questions of site context. Um, and so the, the important question here for us is always like, when, when do you play with the rules and when do you start breaking the rules? And th these are some of the moments that we're trying to tease out with the cabin. They're, they're deliberate moments where we begin to break away from our own logic that has been dictated from the material and where other issues apply. So that's why I think it's important to, to do a formalized full project because it allows other opportunities than the singular isolated study that uh, is only concerned with certain architectural elements. Okay, there's another question. Um, thanks for the nice lecture. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, it was an amazing 
a uh, lecture to apply 3D printing and machines to architecture in various ways. In particular, the forms that overcome structural limitations were beautiful. But many people talk about limitations of these technologies. Um, and I think there are still limitations. I wonder what do you think about the main limitations of this new technology? So, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Yes, there are really plenty and plenty of limitations. Um, I think for us, the, the question is, uh, you know, identifying those limitations and then um, sort of categorizing them in a way that one can react to them architecturally uh, is, is sort of the challenge. Um, and so the first step is uh, uh, identify what the limitations are and they are different for each material system and each um, sort of uh, context also. I think other things need to be taken into account here as well. The, all of these projects that you see are very low budget. Um, so that is a, that's one of the biggest limitations, I would mm -hmm. say, budget and you know how, how many people can work on this for how long. Uh, and so that also dictates a, a lot of the things that are possible. Um, but I also do think that limitations are a good thing uh, because there's something that pushes back. Like with the 3D printing, projects, uh, for example, Leslie talked about the window and how it needs to be corbelled uh, as opposed to a rectilinear window opening because that's the limitation of the printer. So we can use these limitations productively uh, to create new kinds of uh, architectures and that for us is uh, also a, sort of an exciting discovery. Yeah, and maybe in that sense, um, we talked a lot about how it's informed by its robotic routines or you know the, the sort of protocols and process and and that involves not just the opportunities but also the limitations so whenever we encounter a limitation we really try to uh, use that as an opportunity to you know inform the design um, it might be too detailed to talk about, you know, specific examples here, but such as how do you create a reveal of joints between, you know, um, uh, two concrete walls or two uh, 3D printed concrete pieces. So, you know, it, it, um, it definitely kind of filters from the structural to the detail aspect as well. Um, but just to answer kind of the main limitation of this technology right now, I think to really make it meaningful and have, you know, um, uh, the, I guess, impact in our building industry, a lot still have to go back to the question of scaling up. Um, so I think also to add to that is then to realize what are these system or process good at doing and what are they not good at doing? And so that's why, you know, in, for example, in the cabin, you can see that the roof in the end actually very much due to time constraint, time was a limitation as well. Um, we use a conventional um, roof with uh, two by six rafters. Um, so we use the 3D printing or the robotic wood at what it's good at, and we don't try to make it do everything. So I think recognizing the limitation and being smart about when we utilize these um, robotic technology, and then when we can use conventional construction methods um, to couple together, um, is I think is very important. There's one more question here. Uh, when you were designing the cabin, what was your first step? Uh, let's see. What was your first step in terms of planning, also in terms of dimensions, window placing, and the wood structure facade and 3D printing? What did you consider first? Maybe Leslie well, answer this one. <laughs> um, I think um, in 2000, well, when we, want, when we first wanted to build a cabin, we knew that we wanted to use 3D printed concrete. And so maybe somehow related to the last question, um, you know, we were wondering what it's good at doing. Um, so therefore we built, you know, these articulated legs um, taking what we learned from the additive architectural elements and then see how we can apply it in, in the context of the building. Um, and that's also when we realized that, you know, perhaps it's we should integrate a different material and not just um, use wood as the construction method, sorry, solely as a concrete construction method. But then, but then I think for the cabin, it's also a lot of considerations come from context. Like, 
and not everything is um, derivative from uh, from issues of uh, sort of uh, waste efficiency and, and technology. That's only really one driver of, of the project. And so it has multiple narratives that mm -hmm. sort of ties into the next question also. You know, here uh, you said that this technology has the advantage of saving materials and process efficiently. In this era of upcycling and zero waste issues, how do you consider about these concrete and wood materials going back to nature with this technology after the mission is complete as an architecture? I mean, I think that's a really great question, right? Uh, in some ways, it identifies that we have to think even more broadly in terms of uh, product and material cycles. And so there are some, some issues. So the, the cabin uh, does a couple things well and OK, but it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, sort of fully revolutionize uh, building construction. There are still lots of inefficiencies. Also, there is still waste. Uh, and there, are still, uh, there is still the use of concrete, which is not the most sustainable material in the world. And so um, uh, I think we as architects, though, have a responsibility to um, think about these issues and to bring them much more to the forefront um, in, in our projects and to begin to develop an understanding of what are the material cycles, what are cycles of use, and how can we sort of uh, make the, the building process much less wasteful um, um, in, in, in total. And somehow this transition uh, from uh, conventional uh, techniques to new types of construction really gives us that opportunity. Uh, and I think this also gives us the responsibility to fundamentally rethink how these projects uh, or how how buildings are built. Uh, and so I think that's a shared um, sort of responsibility. Yeah, and then in the case of the cabin, um, we're using ash trees here because that's you know one of the kind of important crisis that we would like to deal with. But the same process can also be extended to other wood species or think about um, how, you know, the process can produce different um, glue lamb or other wood products. Um, so like Sasha said, a, lo a lot of it is also about bringing um, some of these issues to the forefront and, th and think of ways how we don't have to necessarily bound by the standardized material, but how we can actually discover other ways of using materials that we normally not use. Um, and uh, so, uh, Raphael, you can tell us how many more questions uh, you you want to do. Uh, we, we're happy to answer all questions. Uh, so we'll just keep going until someone stops us. Uh, so here's another question from the log project. Are you currently testing how to advance it from installation to building form? Um, that's something that we're interested in, definitely. We're not currently doing um, any any research on it right now. Also, uh, due to the situation, the lab is shut down, um, at least uh, in the sort of near um, future. And uh, so we haven't been able to work with our robot, um, I guess, since uh, mid-March or something like that. Uh, but it's uh, certainly something that we're interested in. OK, and I'll read one more question here. Uh, I'm curious to know if how your office is adapting the narratives you might explore in future projects regarding changes in the world because of the global pandemic. OK. Um, um, well, interestingly enough that, uh, you know, in the case of the ash trees, it's, it's like a parallel, right? Um, what we're experiencing as a human species is actually a pandemic that has been going on in our natural environment for a while. The, 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 the issue of the ash wood here is also, um, you know, the Deborah, the Emmer ash bar was transported, you know, because of how globalized and interconnected our world is. Um, so, so that's a very kind of uncanny parallel world that we're living in as well. Um, yeah, but I, I do think that, um, I mean, it's, it's very hard to know the, mm -hmm. the kind of social, economic, environmental impact uh, that this pandemic will have. Um, and so th there, those are some very, very big questions um, where uh, we wish we would have more answers to. But I'm sure that um, just starting to begin to understand the scope of it, um, I, I do think that the, that the question of sort of material resourcefulness and re sustainability 
uh, will become all the more important moving forward. And um, it has been important for us uh, as a discipline in, for a long time, but I think now it's, it's sort of really, um, we're, we're realizing how quickly things can change. And um, when you look at uh, sort of uh, global warming and, and, and these kinds of issues, um, you know, uh, this is sort of, uh, I guess, it's something that really has to be taken seriously. Yeah. Um, and then on the topic of mature resourcefulness, we might be, you know, and um, it, it might be, we might be looking at more um, local material. I think it relates to um, also how we think about localness. Um, so uh, in the case of the ash trees, um, they are distributed in a lot of places and the, the trees that were built with the cabin is uh, basically sourced you know, just right next door. Um, so I think um, material resourcefulness is not only about discovering new ways to use material that we normally won't use, but also a lot of the time, how do we, how do we use local material uh, as well? I think that's important. Um, and then there's one more question. Are there more systems that you are testing? testing? Um, Yes, so I think there. I mean, there's a there's a range of things that we weren't able to show today that have to do with different kinds of material printing and uh, different kinds of uh, studies and in, in wood construction. So this is certainly something that we're that we're working on. Uh, also, one big thing um, that uh, Leslie mentioned is that we are actively working on scaling up some of these uh, processes. So we're working with building industry, both in uh, in concrete and timber. Uh, to see how to sort of move from cabin to building to housing mm -hmm. eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are no more new questions, but there, there's Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, oh gosh, we can hear you <laughs> now. <laughs> Finally. Finally. So at the end. End. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, first of all, if there's any more questions, keep them coming. I think we still have, uh, you know, some time left. Um, so just to quickly, I wanted to say that you forgot to mention in your quick intro, which I should have said, uh, again, that, um, well, first of all, congratulations on winning the Architectural League Prize for 2020, Thank right? You. And mm -hmm. all of the works that you guys are doing shows why you guys want it, you, you're, how valuable the work that you're doing in terms of advancing the industry into investigating how to, take it from the element and become a structural system that becomes a holistic project. Um, somebody wants to ask a question with a camera. I don't understand oh. what that means. <laughs> but go ahead, uh, Hyo Kyung Lee. Uh, hello. Hi. Sir? Yeah, hello, sir. Yes. I just, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sort of a bunch of questions. And this is Hyo Kyung Lee from Hanan University from mm -hmm. two years ago. and recently graduated from Columbia University, GSAP. So really thank you for the lectures and it is really interesting to see the last project is more like ping pong towards uh, materiality and the high technology system. What I wonder is between the projects you have developed through the life of the office, I can see that you continuously develop your own project with not only the materiality, but also the, with the technology. Mm -hmm. What I really wonder is also, it is related to the last questions, not only the materials, but how about the other mechanical or technological system you would apply in the future? Not So what I see interesting in the last part is that you also use the FDM 3D printing method, but further to develop as the scale project, you also use sort of CNC technology to carve the wasted branches or woods. So in the future, what might, what technology other things you would apply in order to scale up your buildings or your architecture piece? Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one of the amazing things about, uh, you know, a robotic arm is that um, it's so versatile. You can put any kind of tool on it and uh, that gives the potential for 
the develop development of a number of new construction processes. Um, so we have identified two or three that we were interested in exploring at various different scales. And we kind of uh, tried to push that as, as far as possible. But we do acknowledge that there are many, many ways of, of doing this. So there are many different ways of 3D printing. There are many different ways of uh, building with the ashwood trees. And then this doesn't even include right now other developments, right, of um, robots that, that assemble at a much smaller scale, um, robots that are not big industrial robotic arms, but are more sort of personalized, uh, small-scale, agent-based uh, construction method. Um, so there's a whole range of, of research that is super interesting that kind of uh, pushes the discourse at a technological level. But I think what was important for us was to show that uh, some of these techniques, when applied from the ground up, produce maybe a, a sort of a slightly unfamiliar kind mm -hmm. of architecture. And it's important to do this from the ground up because there are many uh, sort of in installations, pavilions, small-scale prototypes where um, there, there isn't a kind of full comprehensive um, sort of uh, question of building um, that occurs. And so that's why it was important for us to sort of build the cabin, which admittedly is a very small building. It's a very simple building. It doesn't include all the technologies and all the systems yet, right? Um, but it kind of shows the potential. What if we apply this way of thinking to an architectural design project from the ground up? What is what, is what we're getting? Yeah, and maybe in the role of technology that you know you're you're asking about, I think how um, how you know what next step or what kind of next tools or ways of using that we will explore is um, it's it's uh, it's 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 never about technology alone is is always coupled with um let's say our interest in material or materiality and so um and also our personal obsession in a way and 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 i don't really have you know i don't think we have a answer to okay what is the next tool we're going to adapt and invent um i think um as you know sasha mentioned a lot of these are informed by different considerations. So whether it's the type of resources that we have or material that we encounter, that will inform, help inform um, what kind of technology, technological tools that we would hack or misuse in, in the future. Um, so it's, it's not so much about developing the technology, it's always in conjunction with something else. And that's also why the 3D printer is now fully automated um, our goal was not to, you know, produce the perfect machine. Our goal was to build a machine that will allow us to explore what we want to explore in architecture. Yeah, Thank to that end, actually, answer. I wanted to, to, to add something then. Is the interest about technology or is the interest about optimizing a material? It's... I think it's like if, if like there's there's uh, academics that are interested in technology and then you can go into uh, 3D printing and CNC and uh, supersonic welding and whatever all these other technologies and about testing the limits of the technology but it seems that you guys in the in the approach of taking this bottom uh, bottom up approach to architecture your interest seems more to be about the material rather than the technology that technology is just a tool that allows you to optimize the material. I think it's both important because without technology, we wouldn't be able to, let's say, invent these new forms or new use of material. So, but you, you couldn't know, you couldn't do that without. Um, like, if you start from the log project, for example, you take the mm -hmm. log, and you're looking at it that you cannot. Um, you throw out all these pieces of logs because you cannot get a perfect plank out of it. But actually, if you work with the log, you can actually create new forms, new uses of the material. So then you investigate what technology would allow you to do that. So it starts I mean, with the material. I mean, I would say I would say it's really neither the technology nor the material. It's the translation of these two things into architecture that is sort of the core interest of the practice. 
Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to do at HANA, and that's what we're exploring at HANA. And so obviously technology plays a big role, obviously material plays a big role, but there are so many other factors that play a big role. And so HANA as a practice uh, is, is more free in sort of negotiating different con constraints. Whereas the labs that we both have mm -hmm. are, are more focused on questions of technology, how do we figure this out, and, and, and how do we contribute to a kind of scientific discourse that surrounds these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's really a kind of, uh, it's, it's both, but uh, the, the work that we do in the office is, is much more focused on translations, I would say. Mm -hmm. mm. And then the other thing that, be, that um, captivated me was the idea that you keep on mentioning um, the bottom-up approach allows you to create uh, new formal mm -hmm. moments that would otherwise wouldn't have been uh, possible to design. Um, but then you bring it back to, I mean, you call it uh, unfamiliar, whatever, te technological moments, right? Like when you carve the, the, the wood out and then you, you create the siding that way, um, that you wouldn't design it purposely like that if you weren't taking the material in mind. Mm. So if you're able to produce all these unfamiliar forms, um, is there a need to always bring it back to the familiar? Like this was something that you brought up with uh, Ashen Cabin that the methods of construction allows for these unfamiliar moments, but then you bring it back to the familiarity of the cabin and the um, you know, frame, framing views and and all these um, familiar characteristics yeah. of architecture. Is there um, a need to bring it back to the familiarity of it? Like, couldn't you explore the unfamiliar in all of its manifestations? I mean, I, I think I think this is uh, this is admittedly a work in progress. So this is, um, uh, but I think. I think many of the things that you say, um, I mean, those are all those are all very good points, um, and I, I agree with them sort of fully. In some ways, uh, one could push. Um, no, but the question is, what are you guys interested in? Because I think it's a theoretical point of view that um, I mean, it, maybe it's not a, a, a that it's a evolutionary process. That maybe it is that this is a focus that you theoretically take a stance on. Um, technology being able to produce unfamiliar forms, but somehow we should maintain some familiarity to it. Or it's just, uh, you know, it's something I, I, that to be... I think it's, it's, important, it's important to note that um, the technology alone doesn't produce the unfamiliarness. Um, and so it's, it's really always a ne negotiation between multiple factors. And sometimes the technology can help to produce uh, sort of unfamiliar moments or details or connections or sort of uh, spatial articulation. And sometimes it's it's other considerations that produce that. Um, and uh, so it's the kind of negotiation between bottom-up processes of design and top-down decision-making mm -hmm. that occurs uh, throughout these, these projects. And then it's really a kind of dialing in a, a, a sort of wherever you are kind of ideologically or sort of in terms of personal obsessions, that's sort of how we tune the project for us um, to kind of reference things that we like to reference. And yeah. some of these things are obvious and others are less obvious. And some of those are kind of inside jokes, like the awning that looks like an awning, right? So those are <laughs> things that, that we kind of like. <laughs> and we don't know if, if anyone else likes them or not, but uh, this is sort of why we did it. Um, so the awning looks like that because it sort of looks like that. Um, but it's still, so that's what I mean that it, it's it's still uh, bringing it back to the to the familiar element of an awning, right? We can read it as an awning, and it's not. Bent but that's, wood. that's a position that we're taking. So that's a commentary, right? So I think that's a conscious decision to say, okay, well, we're making an awning that kind of looks like an awning mm -hmm. because we can do that with this system. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of uh, sort of architectural joke that we're running with. Um, and that's the kind of commentary that we're making. That's where we're sort of hovering between familiar and unfamiliar. And when you flip this around, it becomes kind of odd and unfamiliar after all, even though there's a kind of familiarity to it. 
Um, and then maybe to kind of give a more concrete example of what uh, Sasha mentioned about how the unfamiliarity is not due to the technology. You know, in the case of the, 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 the wood envelope, the slicing of the wood, right, it's, you know, it, it, that's nothing new, but the process allows us to slice it, you know, according to the natural curvature. But the slicing itself doesn't give the form. The slicing itself does not inform the, you know, produce the, the architecturalization of the design. The architecturalization in the case of, you know, how the corner burst was, you know, informed by, well, there's a corner moment. If you have to turn, you know, what do you do, right? So the, the unfamiliarity comes in as maybe we have, we're being repeated, like repetitive about, it's, it's about the translation. And, and then the program, what you mean by something that we're familiar, are opportunities for us to explore um, how do you use an opening to, you know, as a, as a moment to play with the articulation of that. And then whether that turn out to be a familiar opening or unfamiliar opening, it's, I guess, that comes down to our own sort of personal decision, obsessions, and um, insider joke and things like that. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Are there any other uh, questions coming from the audience? I think um, we had a may I ask a yep. question? Um, so I'm, I think I'm also curious about your further um, testings. Um, like as a robot horizontally dispose concrete layer upon layer, um, I can tell the concrete surface itself produces another um, surface uh, texture properties, which looks fascinating personally. Um, on that note, I wonder um, what kind of technical improvements uh, your office is working on, like an example, like how to smoothen the surface or like how to improve the production accuracy when transiting from uh, digital to physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we there's some work that we didn't show today related to the sub-additive printing where we're using other uh, post-processing methods um, to deal with some of these questions that you bring up regarding accuracy. Um, so um, this is a paper that we uh, wrote uh, in the lab uh, for Acadia, I think 2018. Um, it's, uh, it sort of talks about was, uh, the first the 3D printing of the additive surfaces and then uh, additional steps to, um, to CNC mill uh, these surfaces to produce really high degrees of accuracy and then you can produce this accuracy where you need it and leave it kind of rough in other moments where you where you don't need it as accurate. Um, and so those are uh, those are sort of procedural and, and process issues that we're con constantly refining. Um, and th those are bigger collaborations uh, with with partners in, uh, in engineering and, and, and so on. So those are broader kind of interdisciplinary uh, research projects that we're taking on. Um, but in some in many ways, like we can't uh, as an architecture office, we're incredibly impatient and we need to sort of uh, deploy these technologies now to see what, what's happening. Um, and so we know that they're imperfect and we do celebrate to some extent these imperfections in the architecture where we, uh, we sort of accept we them. Embrace them, we embrace them, sometimes we accept them. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely still a lot to do in order to dial in the technology to make it more efficient, to make it more automated, to make it more precise. But sometimes that's not always. Um, so that, that's what's so great about operating in a practice and then operating in a lab. We, we are allow, we kind of allow ourselves to do two very separate kind of investigations. Mm. And, um, so in, in order to deploy some of these projects early on, we uh, live with the imprecisions or we embrace the imprecision. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that these project processes will change. Thank you. Any, any other question? I think we're going to start wrapping up. So if anybody has a last question, it's your chance. Uh, I have one question. Yep. Um, uh, you've expanded your reach to furniture as well as architecture. And um, 
I'm wondering if you have something in mind more than architecture and furniture, like very unexpected field for through, mm. through your that 3D technology. Have you have you think it's anything in mind? So Unkyung, are you asking? Are there any other applications other than architecture that you're investigating? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you count urbanism as architecture? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> so, I mean, because this is, maybe Leslie should talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at um, these processes from, you know, the material to the environment. And so, um, you know, if we can construct building differently, we can also think large and think radically and ambitiously about how we can construct our cities, our urban environment differently. Um, and so, you know, currently we are exploring um, how these different ways of building and making can tie to a larger narrative about we think about our environments, our urban environments, our rural urban environments. Um, mostly, uh, where does the opportunity of mass customization uh, come into place that will allow us to, let's say, urbanize our cities differently, you know, in, in the sort of rural context or rural urban context. Um, and so, you know, our city is automatically and majority filled with uh, standardized, um, uh, homogeneous um, building construction systems, apartment buildings, apartment units. Um, so it's all about um, homogeneous and standardizing. Um, so what the technology or how we think about these material is, you know, we can actually start to mass customize. And what does that mean for our cities? And what does it mean for housing at a larger urban scale? But that's some other things that we're exploring um, as well. How about, um, I think Gunkyung would be, uh, maybe she was asking about different industries. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, kind of fashion or furniture or, or yes, product exactly. design. Maybe or, what you're uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's maybe, it maybe goes the other way around. Yeah. Like, so uh, a lot of, a lot of the, these, recent technological developments in architecture are inspired by mm -hmm. a whole other range of, uh, of disciplines, essentially, um, where, where a lot of these technologies have been used uh, you know, for, for a long time uh, by now. Um, I mean, so just talking about sort of 3D printing or sort of computational knitting and things like that, those are all, um, mm -hmm. they have been deployed for a while now in other disciplines. I mean, what we as architects bring in <clears throat> sort of as, as a unique tool set is that um, if, if you sort of follow the, the Mario Carpo argument, is that, that, that architects have at some point understood the, the power of mass customization as it relates to robotic tools, as it relates to computation also, and sort of made that connection um, much earlier uh, than, than some other uh, some other disciplines. So we've now built a kind of critical expertise in that area that can be translated into, into other disciplines. Um, yeah, I, mean, for example, I would agree with you yeah, that so, we're, we're late to the game. Huh? No, I mean, robotic arms have been used, uh, you know, forever in, in car manufacturing, mm -hmm. but the robot has been used in a, in a kind of dumb way in a car factory. It does the same thing over and over. It, it's programmed one movement into this robot and it does that same thing over and over. The, the power of mass customization is that a 3D printer doesn't care if you print the same part a hundred times or if you print a hundred different parts, right? And so this is something that we can begin to leverage mm -hmm. um, in the architecture discipline and we can leverage it for design purposes, but we can also leverage it for material savings, for material efficiency, for weight reduction and all these other issues. No, what I was saying is that I agree with you that, that uh, architects are late to the game or architecture is late to the game in terms of all these uh, production methods. And it's not about us bringing back to other industries, but how we can use the other industries mm -hmm. to achieve new efficiencies in architecture, mm -hmm. which is what you guys are investigating. Um, 
I don't I don't think uh well maybe Leslie will go into fashion design, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um any last questions coming from anybody else? I think we had a pretty good variety of uh, schools and people from around the world. So um, again, last, last questions to kind of wrap it up. Last chance. No? <laughs> okay. Well, I think everybody was very excited to see how you guys are working. I, w I would say that you guys are working in these paradoxes of um, highly formal and informal, highly technical and kind of uh, manual. <laughs> yeah. uh, very rough with very high precision, right? Taking taking a, a rough log and 3D scanning it to get to the precise uh, condition that you can optimize it, right? So I, I feel like your practice keeps on working on these paradoxes and this is what becomes so intriguing to see uh, how to Again, formalize the informal, uh, be precise with the unprecise, uh, be material and elemental, but then at the same time systematic, mm -hmm. right? It's it's uh, like a very encompassing and holistic practice, I think, that you guys have. And um, yeah, I think we, we, we all were very excited to see all the, all the research projects that you guys are, are doing. And we're all looking forward to seeing what comes next. And again, hopefully, maybe that's a fashion design from Leslie. Or... <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> well, hopefully, you'll see like a bigger house next time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. Stay safe. Maybe uh, self-isolate in the Ashen Cabin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not, not that there. far. <laughs> and, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure, and it was a really great um, conversation that we just had. Yeah, so, with you know. the different questions. That was great. Yeah, hopefully next time we'll be live in person. But uh, at least this is one good thing that came out of this pandemic that we can connect many people from around the world. So thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, again, we look forward to what comes next. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us. Have a good yeah. day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.